Hope everybody's doing well. Thank you for coming. I'm Lori Heron. This is my husband, David Heron. And this is Living Word Worship Center. And this is Wednesday night Bible study. So thank you so much for coming. And, and welcome to our Facebook family who's watching as well. Um, we'd like to start out by reading the prayer requests. Um, we have some on the board from the room, and we also have uh, Pastor Larry's list from his Facebook page. So I'll read the names, and then David will uh, will pray for our prayer requests and open our Bible study in prayer. So from the from the board in the room, we have the Neal family. We have Amy, Grayson, Mary, Chris, Mark, is that Bala? Mark Bela. Bela, Mark Bela, Robin, the Heine family, and then from Pastor Larry's um, Facebook page, we have, these are the new prayer requests since Sunday service. We have Robert Kirby Jr. Amy Dudek, Louie and Tina, Bryson, Grayson, Mike Jackson, Kayla, Moore, maybe Kayla Moore, I don't know, Debbie N, Haley and Kylie, Sportster Ken, Leo Beverly Jr., Tammy Yaden, Yadon, uh, another Tammy, Angela McLeod and family, Greg Stone, Deborah Thompson, Thomas Cancel, Barb Andrew, Carrie Lynn Appleby, Harold Nolan, Jimmy Estep, Roy Hamilton, and last but definitely not least, we continue to pray for Pastor Larry and Miss Brenda. Uh, Pastor Larry is uh, recuperating still at home and getting some extra rest. Don? Uh, we're adding Beverly to the prayer request. All right. Anybody else? All right. Okay. All right. Let's pray together, friends. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus, for the gathering of your saints, those in heaven and those in the room. We ask you to be with us tonight as we center ourselves on your word to receive comfort and encouragement for our personal lives, for those that we care about, and for the world in general. And for the people on our list. And especially for the people on our list. We pray that your spirit would go to wherever each of these people are, that they would know your touch personally that they would feel the effects of this prayer and that in a timely way, sooner than they can believe, they will be better, restored, fully able to be exactly who they want, live as they want, and encourage others with their good works. Thank you for these things, Jesus. And for tonight, Lori and I give ourselves to you for this moment of ministry. We ask, Lord, that you would make it better than it was prepared by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. David has asked me to open tonight with a reading from his favorite, Oswald Chambers. Yeah. This is a very old book. Take my glasses off so I can read. This one is called The Supreme Climb. Take now thy son from Genesis. God's command is take now, not presently. It is extraordinary how we debate. We know a thing is right but we try to find excuses for not doing it at once. To climb to the height God 
shows can never be done presently, it must be done now. The sacrifice is gone through in will before it is performed actually. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and went unto the place of which God had told him. The wonderful simplicity of Abraham. When God spoke, he did not confer with flesh and blood. Beware when you want to confer with flesh and blood. For example, your own sympathies, your own insight, anything that is not based on your personal relationship to God. These are the things that compete with and hinder obedience to God. Abraham did not choose the sacrifice. Always guard against self-chosen service for God. Self-sacrifice may be a disease. If God has made your cup sweet, drink it with grace. If he has made, your, if he has made it bitter, drink it in communion with him. If the providential order of God for you is a hard time of difficulty, go through with it, but never choose the scene of your martyrdom. God chose the crucible for Abraham, and Abraham made no demur. He went steadily through. If you are not living in touch with him, it is easy to pass a crude verdict on God. You must go through the crucible before you have any right to pronounce a verdict because in the crucible you learn to know God better. God is working for his highest ends until his purpose and man's purpose become one. Thank you, honey. You're welcome. Yes. Well, I keep wondering when my last time will be up here and Pastor Larry will be back. But I have to tell you, this has been uh, such an energizing experience for me to, uh, to be in a formal position of preaching. I missed it, but you don't know how much you missed something until all of a sudden you're back in it again and you go, wow, I've really missed this. Our study tonight is entitled Pro or Con Consequences. Pro or Con Consequences. What I want you to know is that there are consequences either way. The pro is not an escape from the consequences any more than the con is a punishment for the consequences. They simply are. We are forever attempting to mature in the things of God by his word, lived out through his spirit in Jesus' name. But I'd be lying to you if I didn't tell you I had a preference. I mean, who... who who volunteers for drama? I just, I've never volunteered for drama. I don't know I ever will. But when it is upon me, and when it's clear that that is my assignment, I dive into it like there's nothing more important in the world. Because to resist God is pointless. It is fruitless. It actually sets me back from where I would have been otherwise. So I guess in a selfish way, I do myself a favor and dive in right away, having learned from not doing it. I'd like to read to you from Acts chapter 10. And this is a bit of a long recitation, so I'm going to break it up in two. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion, in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing, having gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius, you ever had God come to you and speak your first name? That's one you won't forget. Cornelius, 
stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa and bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner whose house is by the sea. And we talked about Simon the Tanner last time. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. And he told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. Now something I want you to notice throughout the message this evening is three. It is a repeat theme in this portion of scripture, the threes. Now we may say that the Lord in his sense of humor was simply mirroring the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, not knowing either way, I choose to say yes. Verse nine, about noon the following day as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on a roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. I've had that happen to me before. It's very unsettling. Because all of a sudden, I, I just, it's as if I'm outside of myself. And I'm observing what's going on and hoping very much for God's favor to be the conclusion of that. There have been times that the conclusion has been one of praise. There have been other times the conclusion has been one of severe correction. And if you are gonna devote yourself to Jesus, you better be ready for both. I'm here to tell you that in my experience, his Correction is praiseworthy either way. He's either preparing me for something that is going to do some great service to his kingdom, or he's preparing me to avoid a terrible downfall. And the timing with which I stopped choosing whether it was a good or bad thing he was seeking to correct and simply aligned with him, that's made a big difference in the results. And working with people, you learn that when you delay, it affects them. You never know who is on their face praying, needing something as if their life depended on it. And if you're still messing around with your own conscience, trying to get holy enough to qualify, to minister to them, you hurt them. Don't hurt your friends. Humble yourself. Say yes to God. We talked about that a week ago. We talked about now what? That was two weeks ago, now what was last time, I think. There, there is a scheme to my messages here, and um, I am very decidedly trying to rattle you this evening. That's different than what I've been. Just hear me out. I want to rattle you toward him, not away from him. I don't want to rattle you to create anger. I want to rattle you so that you're able to say, it must be time. It must be time to get on with it. It must be time because if you try to shake away from it, all it does is it's grab you tighter. It's like those things we used to have growing up as a kid that put your fingers in and about the time you try to get out of it, it it gets tighter and tighter and tighter, and then you hope to God your friends aren't going to start tickling you 
while you're trying to free yourself because every time you try to free yourself, it gets further and further down your fingers and you have less and less room to move. Oh God, that we could hear you tonight as you say, you permit us to wrestle with you, but you'd rather us affirm you, affirm your way and do it now. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. And then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Oh, now Peter prided himself on being an Orthodox Jew. And there are certain kinds of things you don't eat. They're outlawed. So, you're going to obey God or tradition? Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. There's once and there's twice. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. In fact, this happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back up into heaven. He lost his chance to obey his Lord. And I'd like to think that he carried that with him the rest of his life. And I'd like to think that that motivated him to say, I don't want to feel this way ever again. Lord, let me obey you right away. Would we say the same? Lord, let me obey you right away. While Peter was wandering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate, they called out. Now, the men that he had sent, there were three. There's another three. They called out asking Simon, who was known as Peter, staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision the Spirit had given him. Oh. See, he's still trying to process his goof up. And all of a sudden, God's got him back in ministry right away. Somebody new comes around, needing his attention. Brothers and sisters, whether you're celebrating or whether you're repenting, be brief about your closure. Because God is looking for people that he can continue to use and continue to use and continue to use. And what that does is constricts the time between events that he needs you. Anyway, while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit came to him. Simon 3, men are looking for you. Are you catching my theme yet? Yep. It's in threes. So get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and sent to the men. I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? Verse 22, the men replied, We have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who are respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told, uh-oh, a holy angel.
You know what it's like when you try to cram too many people into one car seat? It gets real tight in there. And about that time, the holy angel comes along. And then it's really tight in there. Be careful who you sit with for very long. <laughs> the men replied, we have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to have you come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. And then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. All of a sudden, Peter switches into ministry mode. Because in that culture, when you invite someone into your house, that is a, a real display of community harmony, of vulnerability, of availability, and knowing that they're probably gonna stay there longer than what your schedule permits. But out of courtesy in this culture, you stay with them until they are ready to leave. The next day, Peter started out with them and some of the brothers from Joppa went along. Now, Peter had been a wild man before. And his ministry style reflected his personality. See, God's not wanting you to try to imitate somebody you're not. He wants you to be who you are. Now, there will be some rubbing and shaving and whatever, but if you ever get up in the morning and don't recognize yourself, you better get on your knees because God only has one of you. He doesn't need your imitation of somebody you look up to. Oh, I did say that. It's my third time I get to let it out a little more. So anyway, Cornelius was expecting them and he, called, he had called all of his relatives and close friends together. This was not going to be a private counseling session. Peter was not only going to have to deal with him, he was going to have to deal with all the folks. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reference. But Peter made him get up and said, stand up, I'm only a man myself. Talking with him, Peter went inside, and they found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or to visit him. By Peter crossing that threshold, he was in serious trouble. In essence, he had declared himself an enemy from his own tradition. And he stepped into ministry that day. He was no longer a man of God around in his friends, but he was a man of God around people that he wouldn't have chosen to be around, knowing he was going to find out the quality of his friends that he already had. And many were going to just go on about their way and Boy, he did the wrong thing. He's hanging with the Gentiles now. Nobody here, but there are some folk in the church that think bikers are not quite saved. <laughs> then he goes, Well, you're stuck with us because we love it here. Thank <laughs> you. Uh, but God had shown me that I should not call on any man impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask you why you sent for me? Come on, there's got to be somebody in your own crowd so that I could have stayed with my own crowd. Why did you do this? Well, what... Peter needed to be aware of is it that it was our Father in Heaven that set this up. It wasn't just some 
anti-culture group was trying to get him to ruin his fellows. Cornelius answered, for four days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour, at three in the afternoon, <sighs> three. Suddenly, a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, a man in shining clothes. I'll let you decide what that was. And said to Cornelius, God heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa Simon, for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. Don't you love the word? He didn't want him spending all day looking around town. He told him where the guy lived so he could get there as quickly as he could. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Hmm. Peter's saying, oh, I need to pray. God, what, what have you given me to say to these people? Now understand, this was pretty early in his ministry, and so he was, he hadn't really learned the art of uh, meditation. He was about to learn the art of meditation, where you, you get by yourself with God before you go out in public. It's too late then. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. Amen. Boy, his life ended that day. But God accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John had preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. That is so important. Jesus understood his mission. God had selected him to do what could not be done. And you know, everybody and their brother that gets a calling on their life, they go around and they're going to be, you know, God's man of faith and power for the hour. And, and then you're shortly humbled and realize that there's some learning to do before... You need to be let loose in the body of Christ. Jesus concentrated his power on hell. He wasn't concerned about who liked him and who didn't like him, and he wasn't likely to get upset if somebody knocked him down in the marketplace because that wasn't his concern. Get up, dust him off, get on about his day. But he had great compassion for those who were under the dominion of the devil. And he knew, ultimately, he was the only one who could help them. All the priests all their prayers. You know, that may work for sickness. That may work for counseling somebody with a troubled teenager. But somebody's under the dominion of the devil, you better know what you're doing. You better be fasted up, prayed up, and not afraid. Because the enemy 
will situate himself inside your mind and remind you of all those things that you've done that you'd rather no one else know. And he threatens to find some heathen to reveal them to so that you would be shamed. Are you willing to be shamed for the gospel? Mm -hmm. Only if you have nothing to lose. One, One of my mentors, Reverend Bishop Paul Yates, he used to say, he was a wild man from Texas. Okay, he was a good old boy from Texas. He wore his boots proudly, and he had a swagger about him. Now, he had been uh, amazingly delivered by Jesus, and so he had that side of himself too, but he, uh, he used to say to me, when I get out of bed in the morning, I look for the devil. Okay, now that takes a set. When I get, I can hear him say it. When I get out of bed in the morning, I look, and he, he lean for you, I look for the devil. But he's totally reassured of God. What's that? He's totally reassured of God, who God is. Well, the man was not new. He'd been at it for a long time, and You know, he's like everybody else. He got his chops busted a couple times trying to save that which was not ready to be saved. (laughs) You know, if you don't get rejected by a heathen now and then, you're probably not really doing the work. Okay. Sorry, I lost my place. Okay, thank you. Uh, So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May ask why you sent for me. Cornelius answered, four days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa, Simon, send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home with Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism. In other words, what they were doing is they were saying to him, whatever part of your Jewishness is still predominant in your life, get rid of it. You're a Gentile now. If you hang with Gentiles, you become one. And when he realized he really had nothing to go back to, the entire scope of his life shifted, and he loved and preferred to be people, to be with people that would, he would never have wanted to be before. In fact, being with his own people now made him feel a little awkward. Now, some of that's because they'd say, oh yeah, you, what are you coming around here for? You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is loved, who is the Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all those who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses to everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by the witnesses whom God had already chosen, 
by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And I think we talked about how if he wasn't in his mortal body, the baloney would have passed right through him onto the floor. Lest we wonder whether Jesus was just a spirit, he was, his mortality was risen from the dead. Yeah. Oh, folks, that's a central message of our belief. He was risen from the dead. And he stuck around for a while. Now he did go through a wall from time to time. <laughs> especially when there were a group of believers in the second floor cringing with fear that they were all going to get killed. They had a change of heart that day. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Now this is not only in reference to the Old Testament prophets as they were weaving together their messianic um, inclinations toward the birth of Jesus the Messiah, but the prophets of that day all recognized him. I'll tell you what, if you get the prophets on your side, you're good to go. These are the most prophets. I'm telling on myself. Prophets are, are the most unlikely people to be lovable. <laughs> and yet he chose the prophets through which to speak. There's some humorous about that. He chose those people who would have been least likely to be chosen for one side or other for the, from the baseball team until they were the very last ones. There's nobody else to choose. So, okay, I'll take him. I've been there. <laughs> Me too. Anyway, all the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, still, see, once again, now this is the second time that the Holy Spirit has grabbed Peter out of something he was trying to finish talking about and interrupts him and sends him into something else. The Holy Spirit came on all those who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished at the gift of the Holy Spirit that had been poured out even on the Gentiles. You hear the even on the Gentiles. It's like, come on. Now we're going to be equal with them? I mean, for, for how, how many hundreds and thousands of years we have been the chosen of God. That's right, not no more. All are one in Christ. Wow. I'm just so glad there's room for me in your kingdom. Not just Jesus, but your kingdom. That we can be different and yet be together and love one another and worship and participate in, in all the freedoms that this type of church anyway offers us. For they heard them speaking in other tongues and praising God. Now I know there's a lot of controversy about glossalia. But once again, sometimes God has to do something that is very otherworldly to get the attention of the religious. You know, one of them, I think it was, I think it was Peter, whoever, said, I speak in tongues more than all y'all. These were not learned people. They'd never been to seminary to learn other languages. These were 
internal expressions come from the mind of God, translated in their known and unknown languages, for a testimony, not to show off, but for a testimony. When I was at Bowling Green State University, go Falcons, and when I was at Ohio State University, go Buckeyes. See, there is neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, Buckeye nor Wolverine, but all are one in Christ. Mm, shake on that one. Well, if, if you're a Spartan, you too. I, I root for the Spartans at least one time per season when they play that other Michigan team. <laughs> Go green and white. Yes. <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. You know, I just, I, it would be better if I didn't step into that, but I just can't resist. It just gives us something else to rally around about the supremacy of our God. Anyway, all the prophets testify about him, that everybody who believes in him forgives sins through his name, referencing Jesus Christ. While Peter was still speaking these words, verse 44, the Holy Spirit came on all those who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. Amen. I mean, don't, don't you hear the, the cultural insensitivity there? I gotta tell you, the problem was the Jews. The problem was the homeboys. The problem was the ones that had been around from the beginning. Yeah. He had a hard time accepting somebody who was culturally different. For they heard them speaking in other tongues, praising God. Then Peter said, can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They receive the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Now after all this hullabaloo has occurred, Peter gets some downtime. Don't be afraid to take some downtime. As long as we are in these vessels, we will need to be restored and refreshed. Include yourself in that. Don't try to overwork to compensate for those who aren't. Let them deal with being guilty. Don't cover up their lack of duty. Let there be a hole there. Now that may not sound very religious, but I guess it isn't very religious. How are we gonna all grow into unity to the, to the conformity of the spirit of Jesus Christ if there isn't a way for those who for whatever reason are lagging behind, get a chance to experience the travail of catching up so that in catching up, they deeply appreciate and are loyal to what Jesus has done in their life. And they also don't need to feel like the oddball anymore because they're welcome at your card table. Amen. Yes, Rick? I like what you're saying. Leave the hole there. Let them catch up. When I became road captain, the book of books, one of the books of Moses, came to mind when they were leaving the promise or leaving Egypt for the promised land. The instruction was walk as fast as the slowest person can stay with you. And I went, okay, I have skills as a biker, but my skills have to be tempered to the person
person who is lagging behind. Yes. Yes? Yes. See, what we're doing tonight, get a little emotional here. What we're doing tonight in the presence of God is we are saying there never needs to be a reason for somebody to leave our church to go elsewhere because you don't feel like anybody knows them anyway. Who would miss me? You may want to need to sit somewhere different than you normally do on Sunday. It won't kill you. In fact, the church that I used to pastor years ago, if I saw somebody sitting in the same seat two weeks in a row, I'd walk right up to them and tell them to move. Maybe that's why I'm not in pastoral ministry anymore. <laughs> but I am still a prophet, so I, I fit with you. Just have mercy on me. Yes, honey. Before we get finished, I've got a reading out of the Bible, but I think it's a... It's Please. Things like I read last week. Yeah, come on up. Okay. My dear one. Thank you all for hearing me out tonight. Um, I think this is particularly timely because I believe that there are some of us that may not be happy with how the results of yesterday's election went and all the news throughout the nation. There are a lot of people that are happy about the results. There are some that are not. But either way, we, we're here today and we carry on. And I was reading through this and I thought... This is, this is timely for us to hear, whether, whether you're rejoicing today or whether you're licking your wounds or whatever. It's called Reconciliation in and Through Grace. And this, this is written by somebody called Chris Rice. During a lecture, my African-American friend Spencer whose father had been beaten bloody in a Mississippi jail cell in 1970, once suggested that we change the way we pursue justice. Although we must continue to speak on behalf of those who are oppressed and warn oppressors, he said, my willingness to forgive them is not dependent on how they respond. Being able to extend grace and to forgive sets us free. That's right, mm. yeah. We no longer need to spend precious emotional energy thinking about the day oppressors will get what they deserve. Spencer's words that night were not received with thunderous applause, but just three days later, at age 44, my dear friend Spencer died of a heart attack. Mm. Afterward, many told me, they were now taking his words very seriously. But what does it mean to pursue racial reconciliation in and through grace? And when he's talking about racial reconciliation, I'm thinking reconciliation of many areas. You know, this particular reading is about racial reconciliation, but reconciliation can cover many areas of our lives. So what does it mean to pursue racial reconciliation in and through grace? First, it means to recognize that reconciliation is God's gift. It does not begin with our activism. In the realm of racial reconciliation, the language of sociology, marketing, and rights often dominate our talk. The message is, our country is changing demographically, therefore the church must change. Everyone should share in power. Now let's go out and make that happen. Such visions don't say enough about God's desires and God's power. Yes. 2 Corinthians 5 offers a far more beautiful and radical vision. We are God's new creation in Christ and are becoming his ambassadors of reconciliation. 
Reconciliation has already begun with the work of Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.19. And God invites us on the journey of reconciliation, the same journey that the early church was on, a journey that includes interruptions, Pentecost and Acts 2, a reconciliation among social divides, Peter's discovery that the gospel is for the Gentiles, Acts 10 that we just read, Dismantling discrimination against Greek widows, Acts 6, 1 through 6. New intimacy, the church in Antioch, Acts 11, 19 through 26. Speaking to injustice, Paul confronting Peter, Galatians 2, 11 through 14. And especially the Holy Spirit, not Peter or Paul, being the central actor. Yes. Second, reconciliation through grace means working for justice with a spirit of mercy. That's where we need to be today. Yes. We may keep working toward what we feel is our cause or what is right, but if we don't do it with a spirit of mercy, it's, it's waste. Even during the grip of South African apartheid with no guarantee that justice would win, Desmond Tutu preached no future without forgiveness. And Nelson Mandela, from his imprisonment through his presidency, strove for a future of blacks and whites living together. Different ethnic communities have different captivities captivities, and are all in need of the conversion that grace and the new creation make possible. Yes. Without grace, we can miss seeing the possibility of reconciliation. Bitterness can blind an African-American or a Republican, or whomever, any of us. Bitterness can blind an African American from imagining why their church would bother building relationships with whites who don't get it. Legalism can prevent a white Christian from listening to the painful story of a Mexican who crossed the border illegally to feed his family. In everyday situations like these, a lack of grace is tearing Christians apart. At the same time, a major challenge is seeing the depth of racial, ethnic, and cultural brokenness. Grace calls us first to slow down and start with God's gift of lament, to see, name, and feel the brokenness. Only when we experience lament, feel helpless, and let go of control can we open up to our need for God and God's gifts the only things that can rescue us from our alienation. Getting God's God's love into our bones gives us a holy boldness and mercy to take the time to see what's going on in our communities and institutions, the residue, the powers, and the imaginations that exclude others or lead to self-sufficiency. Third, conversion by grace takes time and does not leave us standing complacently where we are. Grace not only takes time, but it gives us time to pursue reconciliation, not with desperation, but by embracing long-term practices and and disciplines that in the light of God's love become graces through which we and our institutions can be converted. And finally, pursuing reconciliation in grace means to journey toward holiness. Reconciliation is not an event or achievement, but a journey that forms the fruit of the Holy Spirit in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Grace insists that segregation in the intimate places of our lives is not normal, inevitable, or acceptable. And that the reconciliation is beautiful when knit and transformed together in visible friendship and common mission for the sake of the gospel. And say that again, for the sake of the gospel. Yes. We not only become like Christ, we are also joined into Christ. Oh, thank you. Thank you. She could preach. Oh, that was. I really don't have anything else to say after that. (laughs) Let's pray.
Father, we come to you, a people seeking to yield ourselves to you wholeheartedly. Take us as we are, Lord. We can't be anything else. Guide us by your Spirit. Allow us to be open to people coming alongside us to to help us in the journey for which none of us have arrived. And we thank you for your word that is just as true and powerful as it was when it was written. And we thank you for Jesus, the Son of God, who made all this possible. Without him, it would just be another garden variety religion seeking to gain market shares. But in you, Jesus, each person becomes a complete fulfillment of you as Christ. We stand together while alone, yet together. Be with us now as we go from this place. I pray that the mercy that you have for us and the joy that we feel would overflow, that we couldn't be quiet about it. We need to find somebody and tell them. Invite them. Lord, we want to pray for our set man, Pastor Larry. Thank you that he is modeling for us wisdom in knowing when it's enough. We thank you for the amazing message you gave on Sunday. I know I was enlarged by it. We ask you to, as quickly as possible, bring him to complete and total healing, that he can resume his normal life and his ministry functions, and even grow more profound than what he is now in your word. We also thank you for Miss Brenda, who is his key support his confessor and his lover. Thank you that you've given them as a sample to us about what it can really be like that we would strive for the same. Jesus, we pray these things in your precious name. Amen Amen. and amen. Thank you, everybody.